Governor Mary Fallon was elected November 2, 2010, during a historic election in which she became the first ever female governor of Oklahoma. She was inaugurated on the steps of the Oklahoma Capitol as the 27th governor on January 10, 2011. After a successful career in the private sector as a manager for a national hotel chain, Fallon made her foray into the public service in 1990 when she was elected the Oklahoma House of Representatives. This became her long and distinguished career as a public servant, and she dedicated herself to conservative common sense solutions faced by Oklahoma families and small businesses. During her time in the House, Fallon earned a reputation of being a consensus builder who was willing to reach across the aisles, serving as the Republican minority. She managed to pass more than a dozen bills that were signed into law by the state's Democratic governor and was honored as the Legislature of the Year by the American Legislation Exchange Council. As governor, Fallon listed job growth and retention, elimination of government waste, improving the health and wellness of Oklahoma as her priorities. Fallon serves as the vice chair and in three weeks will be the first ever Oklahoman to chair the National Governors Association. She's a graduate of Oklahoma State University. She is married to Wade Christensen and Oklahoma's first gentleman and the, the couple has six children between them. Please give a Tulsa welcome for the Honorable Mary Fallon, Governor of Oklahoma. You. Thank you. I appreciate that. It's great to be in Tulsa today. Johnny, thank you so much for that very kind introduction. I appreciate it and thank you for all that you do for the Tulsa Chamber and certainly in Cox Communication and all that your company does to be a great civic uh, citizen in our state. We appreciate you and, and your great leadership and it's always great to be in Northeast Oklahoma in the regional area for all of our Chambers of Commerce and Mike, I heard that this is the largest crowd you've ever had for your state of the state, and one voice agenda, chamber, regional concept. So it's exciting to see so many people here today. Thank you all for taking time to come and to talk a little bit about the future of the state of Oklahoma and some of the issues that we're working on in our state. And I just want to say that there's no denying that Oklahoma's economic success in, in a large part is due to the cooperation that we have and partnerships that we have between our chambers of commerce that are represented here in this room, certainly with the state of Oklahoma. And so your voice, your one voice, does make a difference in Oklahoma's future. It does make a difference in policy at the Capitol. And so we appreciate all that your chamber does. So Mike, thank you for your service with the Tulsa Chamber and all the other chambers that are represented here today. And Jake Henry, where did you go? Is he still here? somewhere. But I want to say thank you to Jake, too, for his chairmanship of the Tulsa Chamber and certainly to the entire chamber and your board of directors and the other chambers that are represented here in this room. And of course, we have a great turnout of other mayors from other communities. Welcome to all the mayors. Mayor Bartlett, it's great to be back in your town again. Great to see you. Appreciate all that you do, too. Tulsa's doing very, very well. You heard uh, mention that Superintendent Janet Barisi is here. We're glad to have her, our statewide officials. And also, Auditor Gary Jones, who has joined us, and Congressman Bridenstine, it's good, great to see you here. I had an opportunity to visit with these folks a little earlier today. We're also joined by a lot of the members of the Oklahoma legislators, legislature, some elected officials, county commissioners, and as I said, mayors. So thank you all for coming today to join us. And as was mentioned, I have several of my cabinet secretaries that have joined us here, Tolson, your Secretary of Finance and Revenue, Preston Dorflinger. Preston, where are you? Right, right in front of me. There you are, front row seat. Good job. He's here. Our Secretary of Transportation, Gary Ridley. We appreciate his great service. Our Secretary of State, Larry Parman. And our Secretary of Education, Phyllis Hudecki, who many of you may know is retiring to go back into the full-time sector at o OBEC, Oklahoma Business Education Consortium. And we very much appreciate her service to our state. And I always love coming to Green Country because it's always fun to get an update on the great things that are happening here and to visit with lots of friends and certainly to visit with the business community. And every time I come to Green Country and Tulsa and this particular area of the state, I always 
hear something very, very interesting, see the great things that are going on. Yesterday afternoon, I had the opportunity to meet with one of your big civic leaders of the city, one that I know is very committed to Tulsa, very committed to the state of Oklahoma. I know all of you are familiar with George Kaiser, but he gave me a wonderful presentation of the gathering place and the river development that's going to be going on, and I got to see the whole long uh, model of what it's going to look like along the river and the park and all the tremendous activities that are going to go on here in, in this region. That is so exciting. And I just want to say thank you to George and to Ken Levitt and the various members that have been working on that. Thank you to George specifically for his tremendous contribution to get the project started, to make it possible for the Tulsa community, the Tulsa area. It will be a huge economic development a draw for the state, will enhance the quality of life in this area of the state and will certainly be a, a great place for families and children to be able to enjoy the beauty of, of Tulsa area. So thank you. If you see George, give him a pat on the back and tell him how much we appreciate him and the other investors that are helping to develop the riverfront. It'll, it'll make a big difference. And every time I come here, I also love to see what's going on in the Brady District and see the boom and the development that's going on downtown. It's always very exciting to see the, um, there's so many different things from the Griffin Media Center, which is a tremendous asset, the Woody Guthrie Museum, the BOK Center, all the great concerts going on. I just had the opportunity to stay at the Aloft Hotel last night. Great new facility in City Hall, old City Hall, wonderful addition to downtown. And of course, all the real estate, uh, living, the, the housing downtown is, is very, very exciting for Tulsa. So it's a good time, I think, for Tulsa. Good time for your community, and you certainly have tremendous leaders in this area. And it's no surprise that Tulsa is receiving a lot of national attention, and that's good. It's good for not only Tulsa and the region itself, but it's certainly good for the state. I was going through a list of various national publications looking at how Oklahoma ranks and how Tulsa in particular ranks. Tulsa has actually been ranked number one as the most affordable city in the country. That's a good thing to have as a listing when you're trying to recruit new business to uh, the Tulsa community. It's been ranked number two for the best place for young people to live. Great thing. Number three for the best employment outlook in the nation. Number four nationally as a place to start a business and the fifth best place in the nation to buy a home. I tell you, with those kinds of rankings and numbers, it's exciting what the future holds for this area of the state and certainly for the Tulsa region. So that kind of prosperity course is not just limited to Tulsa. We are seeing a renewal from the recession that we have been through as, as a state. We're certainly seeing a lot of economic development in northeast Oklahoma. And success doesn't happen by accident. It's because of all your hard work as businesses, as mayors, elected officials, certainly the civic leaders represent this room that are making outstanding things happen. And we, as a state, hope to be a good partner for you to help you continue to grow Oklahoma's prosperity, to create the best business climate possible, continue to work with your regional chamber and your one voice agenda, which has really helped us on our policy development at the state capitol. So we appreciate that. And I just want you to know that the state wants to be your partner all the way. Now, I want to move on. As many of you have heard me say many, many times, my number one priority is to create jobs, to grow Oklahoma's economy, and to raise the standard of living in our state so that Oklahoma is the go-to place to do business, to raise a family, and to work. And that has been how I have looked at each type of a policy that's come across my desk, legislation that's come across the governor's desk, to work with our cabinet secretaries so that we can create the very best business climate and also the best place to raise and live, raise, raise a family and to live. And of course, that prosperity, I think, is coming from the private sector. And the private sector has been doing much better in the state of Oklahoma. Recent figures show that in our numbers for our state, show that our economy is going. Since 2011, We've created new net jobs, 57,000 new net jobs in the state of Oklahoma. And we finally have reached that pre-recession job level that we had lost during the 2008 economic downturn over those years that followed after that. In 2011, our unemployment rate in Oklahoma was 7%. 
We've seen a 30% drop down to 5% in our state, which is great news for Oklahoma. And now we have one of the lowest unemployment rates in the nation. And certainly Tulsa has had a low unemployment rate. Oklahoma City's had a low unemployment rate, and that, that is proving good for our state. One of our other top goals was to increase the standard of living in our state. In other words, how our families are doing. In the year 2011 to 2012, we saw our per capita income for a family of four increase $4,000 for that one year alone, ranking Oklahoma number one in the nation in per capita income growth for that family in that year. And it's because of that tremendous growth in, in our jobs, it's because of our lower unemployment rate, that we are also seeing a, a good increase in our revenue that comes into our state budget and certainly goes into our, our rainy day savings account. And speaking of rainy day savings account, in 2011, because we had just come through the economic downturn and had three years of budget shortfalls in our state, that the legislature had to balance the budget and prioritize spending. When I took office in January 2011, we had $2.03 in our rainy day savings account because we had gone through a national recession. The legislature had some pretty tough years they had to work with. They had to use a lot of the rainy day fund to help balance the budget and fund education and transportation and other important priorities of the state. But because of the successful property, po successful policies that we've been able to implement over the last many years with the legislative help, we've been able to grow our rainy day account to just under, it was just under 600 million, but we recently took out 45 million through the legislature, which I deeply appreciate, to assist our fellow Oklahomans that were hurt so, so bad by the tornadoes and went through more. So now we have a healthy deposit of over $530 million in our savings account, which means we turned the corner in helping to get Oklahoma a more stable, vibrant economy. And so I wanna thank the legislature for all their work and the various pieces of legislation we've been able to enact and, and to work to support our businesses and to help put into place policies that would grow our economies. And one of the best ways to grow Oklahoma's economy is to make sure that we have a highly skilled, educated workforce. And that is one of our top goals. And that means working on education. It means dealing with education um, itself and policy and reform. Funding education, those are all important goals that we've worked towards in our administration. And here's why that's important. Studies show that 50 years ago, 75% of the jobs in America just needed a high school degree to make a decent living, 50 years ago. But today, if you look at the jobs and the skill sets that are required in today's global marketplace and even here in Oklahoma, 60% of our jobs that we have in our state require at least a career technology certificate, an associate degree, or a bachelor's degree or above, 60% of our jobs. So we've seen a huge reversal in the type of skill sets and education that's needed, not only in our state, but certainly throughout the nation. And that's why it's essential that we as a state continue to work on education, developing the best educated workforce possible. So not only can we attract new jobs to our state, but certainly to retain the jobs in our state. And we also know that if we look at our high school graduates, that three quarters of those high school graduates may not graduate. A lot of them drop out of school. And we know of the three quarters that do graduate from high school, that only about half of those will enter into some other type of, of higher education, whether it's career technology or whether it is going to in, into the higher education system. And so that's why it's essential that Oklahoma builds a pipeline for prosperity, working with our K through 12, our career technology centers, and also with our higher education systems to create the type of workforce that will help grow Oklahoma's economy. And that's our challenge. It's a challenge not only for here in Oklahoma, but it's a challenge throughout the United States so that our children can find the type of jobs that they need, so that our businesses can find the type of skilled workers that they need so they can once again grow and prosper. So several years ago, our administration launched what we call Complete College America. And the goal is and was and still is 
to be able to increase the number of degree completion in our state, to increase the number of career technology certificates, whether it's computer technicians, welders, whatever that particular profession might be, electricians, whether it is to get more associate's degree in, in different fields, when certainly to be able to get more bachelor's degrees and, and those above, so that we would be able to continue to grow our economy. So we set a goal for our state. We know that typically we graduate each year around 30,500 graduates annually, and we set a goal that we were going to try to increase that number over the next decade by uh, 2023 up to 50,900, which is a pretty big jump. And so we set a goal with higher education or career technology centers that we wanted to have an additional 1,500 new degree completion each year, 1,700, excuse me, 1,700 new degree completion each year. And the first year we implemented that program last year, we didn't do the 1,700. In fact, we did 2,900 new degree completion and we beat our goal by 71% of putting more highly skilled, educated workers in our workforce. I think that's a good thing. And we all know that not only is, is degree completion, accountability standards, uh, transparency, all important in education, but we also have to have funding, especially for common education. So I want to thank the legislature for making it a priority this year to work with our office and certainly those in, in the education profession to be able to budget an increase of $91 million new to common education. We appreciate that. I think that'll go a long ways in helping our education system. In addition to that, we also budgeted an extra $33 million for higher education and $3 million for our career technology centers, which I think once again goes to show that Oklahoma is committed to education. As our economy continues to improve, we, start, we begin to generate better revenue in our state. Certainly 120 million total increase for education will go a long way and it certainly will help our education systems and, and that's very, very important. So it's been a priority for us at the Capitol to continue to work on education, workforce type issues. And uh, without that, we're not gonna have the type of, of jobs and, and work that we need in our state. And finally, as, as I'm talking about education, I also want to mention that we know that it is important that we match the type of skills and the type of degrees and the type of certificates with the type of, of major ecosystems in our state. And so we did an analysis of where do we generate the most wealth in Oklahoma, our Commerce Department did it. And we know that we have key industries that are the most important that generate the most wealth. And we know that many of those professions in, in that in, those industries require what we call STEM education, science, technology, engineering, and math. That goes along with the aerospace industry, certainly with the energy sector, manufacturing, agriculture, I mean, all those types of industries, healthcare, require STEM-related, uh, educated workforce. And so we have been working very hard to form, and, and we will have a STEM education summit that will be held in August. And uh, we're excited to be able to bring that forth and to begin working with our communities, businesses, and industry leaders to have a comprehensive strategy for workforce development, especially as it relates to some of our core key industries in our state. And uh, we're excited about that. Now, along with not only having education, certainly, and, and workforce issues, we also think it's very important to have the best business climate possible. And so I'm very proud that the legislature has worked with our office to be able to give us at least two tax cuts so far since 2011. We had a, a tax cut in 2011, and then, of course, this legislative session, the legislature also passed another tax cut that's in two phases. And by the time 2016 hits, if, if, if everything's going good in our economy, we're going to drop our income tax rate down to 4.85% and let more of our Oklahomans keep more of their hard-earned money. Mm -hmm. I want to tell you why that's important. I mean, first of all, I think it's important to let people keep more of their hard-earned money to support their families. 
but it's also important from a competitive standpoint in that we compete with other states for jobs and companies and investment, not only to keep investment in our state, but to attract new businesses to our state. And I frequently will go out and compete against California, who now has raised their income tax rate to 13%, has had huge budget problems over the last many years. And that's actually our number one state where people move from to Oklahoma is California. It's kind of fun to see that reverse of the, of the Dust Bowl days, of Grapes of Wrath, where people are actually coming back to our state because of our low cost of living, because of our business climate, our low taxes, focusing on education, workforce, those types of issues. So from a competitive standpoint, whether it's California, whether it's Illinois, you raise, I think they raised your corporate income tax 63% years ago. Other states that have high tax rates, have budgetary issues. It makes us more competitive as a state to get that investment. So we've been certainly working on our tax structure to make us more business friendly. We've also been working to make government, as Johnny mentioned, more smaller, smarter, more efficient so that we can conserve taxpayer dollars. And this year, the legislature worked with us to be able to consolidate 75 different boards and commissions into shared services to make it more efficient, to save us some money. So thank you to the legislature, great accomplishment. And of course, roads and bridges is always, infrastructure is always very important to our business community. And Secretary Ridley has worked hard along with our transportation commissioners to implement a couple of years ago, our bridge improvement and turnpike modernization plan for our state, which we launched in 2011. And because of that, we've been able to make huge inroads into fixing many of Oklahoma's structurally deficient bridges in our state. And we're very proud of a tremendous work that's been done. Just to give you a little measure of where we're at, in 2004, we had 1,200 structurally deficient state owned highways and state owned bridges, excuse me, in our state. But because of the work that Secretary Ridley's been doing with his team, and you've seen it around Tulsa, we've gone from having 1,200 in 2004 to now having 556. And by the time we reach 2020, we anticipate and we plan on having all the structurally deficient bridges on the list right now, all 556, totally fixed and repaired in the state which I think will be a great accomplishment for Oklahoma. As you probably have seen that the Creek Turnpike has been under widening. The Kilpatrick Turnpike's almost finished. The Creek will hopefully be finished by this fall. It'll help relieve congestion, certainly be great for uh, Tulsa and Northeast Oklahoma too. And speaking of, of transportation, we talked a little bit about this in a pre-briefing that we had, but one of the things we've been doing with the energy sector, which is very crucial to Oklahoma and crucial to Oklahoma's economy, is focusing on ways that we can once again save taxpayer money, utilize an Oklahoma produced resource, an American produced resource, and that is we've actually launched a plan in our state that began over a year and a half ago to work towards being able to purchase natural gas vehicles for our state cars, for our state fleet system. And so we've been doing that slowly but surely, and we have around probably around 400 cars now in the state fleets that is using natural gas, and I have a natural gas biofuel car that I utilize, and my, my staff told me the other day they went to fill it up, my, the hybrid troll, and it cost them $8 to fill it up with natural gas. So big savings for the state of Oklahoma, so that's very exciting. And then, of course, I want to mention about workers' compensation reform. We had a great legislative session. One of the top issues facing our businesses has been the high cost of workers' compensation, and this year our legislature took a big step forward and pass a major comprehensive overhaul of a workers' compensation system to enact an administrative system and to have some other provisions in there to reform workers' compensation, while also taking care of the injured workers, which was very, very important to me, but also helping to make us more competitive as a state with our workers' compensation rates. So thank you. I know that's one of the major issues for the One Voice agenda was to have workers' compensation reform, and, and we're glad about that. Just quick mentions, the legislature also worked with us on the governor's closing fund, which I know has been on your agenda. We appreciate that. That helped us land GE and our International Global Energy Research Center into Oklahoma just a couple of months ago. It's very exciting because they're going to be creating lots of new research and development jobs for energy. And then finally, I want to talk about health care real quickly because that's an important, not only important quality of life issue, but it's an important economic issue for not only our private sector industry, but certainly for the state of Oklahoma. When it comes to our health, 
Oklahoma hasn't done as well over the past many years. We've been ranked over the years 49th in the nation in health outcomes, we have, uh, poor health, in other words, in our state. But we've been working slowly but surely on health policy in our state, and now we've moved from 49th to 43rd in the nation. Move the needle in the right direction. It's getting better, but we still have a lot more work to, that needs to be done. And so this year we've also worked with the legislature to be able to appropriate more money for Medicaid, Medicaid population in our state, which I appreciate, $40 million of money to support uh, the Medicaid population, and $17 million more for mental health and substance abuse services in our state. And that'll go a long ways in helping us to improve the state. Those of you also know that we've been working with the Insure Oklahoma program, which is our state private insurance program to help the working poor and trying to keep that program. We had been notified that the um, White House and the administration was not going to give us an extension on the Insure Oklahoma waiver, which we've had since 2006, that expires in December. But I went back to the White House and told them that it's been working good for 30,000 people in the state of Oklahoma. We'd like to keep that as our Oklahoma, as one of our Oklahoma solutions in improving health and access to care in our state. And I got, actually got a phone call from Secretary Sebelius a couple weeks ago saying that they were looking at and, and still discussing with us, giving us a one-year extension on our Insure Oklahoma program and um, working on some details still to see if that's possible because they have things they want, we have things we need and want, but at least we have the door open to possibly be able to extend that. And with all the uncertainty that's been going on, as we've all seen in the news recently, about the federal health care bill, the delays, the cost, the, all those estimates, I think that's uh, good news for us. So we're excited about that. And then this morning I had the opportunity to go to the o OSU Medical Center. The legislature also appropriated $16 million of funding to help meet the uh, costs of the uninsured, those that go to that facility, and to help keep the OU, OU Wayman Tisdale Center functional and, and operational here in Tulsa. So thank you, legislators, for doing that. That's very important for our health care in our state. So clearly, I hope you see that we're working on a lot of different multifaceted issues in the state of Oklahoma, which I think is having an impact. Still a lot more work to be done, but uh, I'm proud of where Oklahoma's going right now, and I think our future looks great. Especially looks great here in Tulsa, and we're excited about what's happening in Tulsa. So thank you so much. And Mike, I'll be happy to stop here. I know you got some questions people want to ask. First of all, uh, carrying on with the health care theme, there are a number of questions about the next steps Oklahoma needs to take in an effort to address the health care issues that are on the horizon and the uninsured issues. You mentioned insure Oklahoma. Would you like to expand on that and what you see happening over the next several months? There's a lot of volatility around our nation right now with the Affordable Health Care Act, as we have all seen in the news, especially over the last, well, last couple of years, but especially the last couple of weeks with the president delaying the mandate on the uh, businesses to either provide health insurance or pay penalties. That was an interesting move. We've certainly seen that there have been some new cost projections that the new Affordable Health Care Act is going to cost the, the nation a lot more money than was originally anticipated. In fact, the CBO released a report saying that it was going to have a, an additional cost increase of $30 billion, $30 billion dollars on the nation's economy. So there is a lot of uncertainty. As you've heard me say many times, uh, we're working towards uh, an Oklahoma plan. There is three legs to our stool in getting health care policy in, in our state, and that's my office, in the House, in the Senate. And so we all three have to come together to agree upon our health care, what we're going to do with our Oklahoma health care plan. We actually hired a national consulting firm that is very well experienced to look at our Medicaid system, to look at our current Insure Oklahoma system, to look at the federal law and what Oklahoma will be mandated to do with federal law, but also what some of the options are that we would have for our state. They certainly suggested that if we could, that we would keep Insure Oklahoma. As I mentioned, we had been told that it's going to expire in December, so I started working on it. Uh, as, as was mentioned, I'm going to be the national chair of the Governor's Association in about three weeks. So I have some pretty good contacts with the, with the White House. So I called them up and said, they, they asked me what they could do after the tornadoes. And so I said, well, you can, you can renew my Insure Oklahoma. That would help. 
gave them a laundry list actually of things. But anyway, they asked, I'm going to tell them. And so we have had, as I said, a phone call that uh, they are looking at possibly giving us a, a one-year extension, but we are negotiating. Uh, Nico Gomez, who's the head of our health care authority, is negotiating on Oklahoma's behalf, and we'll see where that ends up. But all in all, I think there are a lot of things that are moving parts in our nation in the area of health care. In the meantime, I'm working with our Secretary of Health. We have great um, programs called Certified Healthy Businesses, Certified Healthy Schools, Certified Healthy Communities, in which we talk about health and wellness and people taking personal responsibility for their health, taking charge of it. And you'll find that the majority of illnesses that Americans face are illnesses that are caused by habits, whether it's smoking, whether it's, whether it's weight issues, whether it's lack of exercise, whether it is um, sugar intake, I mean, smoking, all those different things. And so a lot of different challenges ahead of us. But in the meantime, we're working on health. The other thing I'm very proud of that's very important to me is that we also deal with Oklahoma's high use of prescription drugs and the abuse that we have with substance abuse in our state. And we've been working diligently with our mental health director, Terry White, to implement better services for our citizens to get help with substance abuse in our state. And so we appropriated a lot more money. The legislature helped pass three different pieces of legislation dealing with prescription drug abuse in our state, and I think that'll go a long ways also in helping to improve the health of Oklahoma. Thank you. This question focuses on common education funding, and it acknowledges the increase in funding in the last session, but also wants to know what your priorities will be going forward, including as it relates to teacher salaries. Well, and that's education funding is a priority for our administration, and I frankly heard that from the legislature many, many times. They were all on board. That's why we got the increase that we got this year. And of course, it's been very challenging for education because since we took the economic downturn in 2008-2009 in the national recession, education took some hits as well as did many other entities in the state of Oklahoma. We've tried in, in my budget over the years to protect education as much as possible from any types of cuts and to slowly but surely be able to add additional money to education funding along with all the other things we have to provide for in our state. And certainly education received the largest share of additional funding this year as an, as an entity within all of state government itself, more than health and human services, transportation, corrections, all those different entities. It got the largest share of funding of new money in our state and will continue to be a priority. Certainly we know that there are areas of the state, pockets of the state, where teachers need better salaries, and that is something that as we continue to grow Oklahoma's economy, grow our, our revenue base in our state, we'll be looking at in the future. In the meantime, we have allocated money to fund the reforms that have been enacted over the last several years, and I think it's important. You don't just pass legislation and not fund them. You have to fund those uh, types of reforms. So we've done that. Legislature also added additional, I think it was 17 million, Preston, for health care benefits to help shore up the health care benefits of our teachers, too, and, and that will go a long ways. Uh, we have several in the audience interested in transportation and are particularly appreciative of your leadership in tra transportation infrastructure. Uh, this question focuses on future bridge repair and the role the state and municipalities can play in that. Absolutely. One of the portions of our bridge plan, our eight-year plan that Secretary Ridley developed so beautifully and we implemented in 2011, was not only to address our state-owned bridges, but to help our counties and our local communities with their bridges, too. And so we passed legislation um, back in 2011, I think, also, that put more money towards county bridge programs. And another brilliant thing that Secretary Ridley thought of, and I really think this is so smart, was that some of you may know that the I-40 crosstown in Oklahoma City had been under construction, reconstruction, for many, many years and had recently been completed. And so they took down the old elevated crosstown and that went through downtown Oklahoma City, and there were about um, a little over 2,000 steel beams that they were able to salvage from the crosstown to be able to repurpose to give to the counties with some additional funding to the counties so that the counties could use those beams to rebuild the county bridges. There was a recent report out that said that Oklahoma still ranked one of the worst states in the nation on bridges. 
Well, that's because the report took into effect the city bridges, the county bridges, and the state bridges. And so, yes, we do have a long ways to go on repairing our bridges, but we have made a huge dent in repairing that, and we certainly know that our county bridges are very important to you. Governor, you addressed your interest and concern about for the program Complete College America and your leadership in that area. Uh, this question uh, speaks specifically to the need to generate more skilled workers in our communities to fill jobs. Uh, we're closing in on almost uh, no unemployment uh, problems. So what would you like to see happen in the next uh, several months in a legislative session related to filling the need for skilled workers? That is a huge issue for the state of Oklahoma because as you have lower unemployment, it's harder for businesses to find the workforce that they need. So we've done several things recently. One is our Department of Commerce looked at all of our employment codes within the Employment Security Commission and national codes to look at the types of jobs we have in our state, to look at what I call our, our wealth generating jobs. You have your minimum wage jobs, and you have jobs in the aerospace, uh, health care, transportation, agriculture, um, energy that create the better paying jobs, manufacturing better paying jobs. But to look at what skill sets are needed in those particular, we, we call it our top five ecosystems in our state, and then to look at the various skills and courses that are being offered, whether it's in our career technology centers or even in higher education, to make sure that we're matching those needs. In other words, if we need aerospace technicians or energy uh, technicians or some type of welders, and we're making, we're, we're educating basket weavers, that's not gonna work. <laughs> and so we've been working on developing that pipeline of work skills to be able to fill the needs of our current industries in our state. The other thing we've done, we know that we have individuals out there who look for jobs in Oklahoma. So we launched the, the first ever, and it, we believe it's a national model that is what I would call, it's almost like a job dating service. It's called okjobmatch.com. It's on my website, Commerce website. But basically what we did, we put in different skill sets that companies need in their various professions and industries, and also various resumes with the skill sets that individuals have and this computer system, through a series of questions, actually matches those people. Like if you're a, a one star, then you may not be a good match for that particular company or that employee may not be a good match for you. But if you're a five star match, then you, that's probably gonna be a pretty good employee or pretty good company for you to look at that might be interesting to you. So we have that system up and running. We have over, I think it's over 60,000 resumes that are in the system and over 300 companies that are already in the system. So we think that will help with our workforce needs in our state, along with our Complete College America, and uh, working on fine-tuning the, the courses that we offer in our state higher education career technology centers. You may have some opinions on the role of EPA and how it impacts the ability of the energy industry in Oklahoma to provide affordable and reliable energy. Well, I think it's very crucial that we have a fair and balanced EPA. I don't always feel they're that way, but it's certainly important for our businesses, our industry sectors. It's important for our municipalities. It's, a, it's important for uh, being able to conduct business and have um, the various industries that we have and, and creating jobs. But I also believe that we have to be good stewards of our land and our water and our air. And as long as we have a balanced approach with the EPA to where we can meet both of those standards of having something that takes care of, of our precious resources, but also is balanced so that we can create vibrant economies. That to me is, is the best type of rules and regulations the EPA can give us. I haven't always been happy with some of their policies, um, especially, oh gosh, we, we've seen everything from its effects upon agriculture to its effect upon our, our water systems to its effect upon the oil and gas industry, certainly clean air and manufacturing to our coal plants and natural gas plants, electricity generation. I mean, there are so many different things that the EPA gets in, involved into. Our water navigation systems. Uh, Congressman Bridenstine will certainly know all these issues from being in Congress. It's complicated, but what I will tell you that when we see things that we think is not fair or might be harmful, 
to Oklahoma, we do frequently send the EPA letters telling them our opinion here in Oklahoma. Sometimes we get a change of heart. Sometimes we don't, but we will always try. Governor, our last question is, what are the prospects for a special session to deal with lawsuit reform? Where's my legislators? They're all right here. Well, I will tell you that a special session is an option that I am looking at, and I've talked to the speaker and to the pro tem about the possibility of having a special session to be able to fix what I, what I consider to be one of our most important pieces of legislation in 2011, that was our lawsuit reform legislation that we passed. That is certainly an option for us to go back into special session to address some of the concerns that the Supreme Court had expressed in their recent ruling. There may be some other issues as, as possible that we might look at even in, in special session as, as the year goes along if there are some other challenges, possibly with some other reform efforts that we've enacted even this year um, in, in workers' compensation or even in the, in the tax cut itself and, and fixing the capital and the repairs itself. So those are, are certainly options. I'm, I am keeping that option open, and certainly I'm having those discussions with the leadership in the House and Senate to try to build consensus on the path forward that we want to go. And finally, a softball question is sort of a tradition for these uh, events. So we want to ask you if you'd like to select Tulsa as your location to announce uh, whether you're running for governor. Oh. Oh. Hmm. I don't think I have my stuff here with me to do that. Mike wants to answer that question. Absolutely. Mike says absolutely, but you never know. Not today, but wait and see. Thank you for visiting and thank you for taking your time for our thank questions. Thank you. It's great to be here. Thank you, uh, Lauren Brookie, and thank you, uh, Governor Fallon. Uh, let me just tell you that we truly love having you in Tulsa. We truly ha love having you in Tulsa, Northeast Oklahoma, and we appreciate your willingness to continually come back and visit, to discuss our challenges, to discuss our opportunities, uh, to discuss uh, things that we need to do to continue to grow our region, improve our local communities, uh, and certainly uh, uh, improve our state. Uh, likewise, from the chambers, all of our collective chambers, uh, we really appreciate your support uh, in, in hand in hand with all of us on economic development, working with the Department of Commerce, uh, Dave Lopez, John Kirshner, and others, our Tulsa's Future effort and our regional partners, but your support on the Verizon project and your support on so many other e economic development projects across this state and across this region. We appreciate the very active and aggressive role that you play that. We appreciate the role that you and uh, Mayor Bartlett played last fall in leading the uh, governor's European trade mission uh, to visit a number of companies uh, that employ hundreds and thousands of people in northeast Oklahoma. So thanks for all you do. We appreciate you. Thank you very much.